Well, good morning, and welcome to the Roaring Lambs Bible Study. My name's Anton Scala, and on behalf of our founder, Gary Kinder, and my wife, Donna, and I, we want to wish you a very happy Easter. You know, this is the great Easter lesson. It comes after Friday, and I remember that Gary Kinder always used to say, he quoted that old preacher that used to do the sermon on, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And we're all going through a very difficult time right now. We certainly pray for your health, your family's health, your business's health. And we just ask that you would do the same for your friends and family. Today, we're gonna to have a two-part lesson. We'll have um, an Easter lesson, and we'll also get back to our lesson on Revelation. Uh, last week, if you go to your outlines, which hopefully you got emailed to you, uh, if not, then you can follow along the Easter lesson right at Matthew. I took all the examples from that gospel. And then when we get to Revelation, we'll be doing chapter 16 today. So if you take your outline, you can see what we learned last week. Uh, last week was Palm Sunday. And we had incredibly high traffic, so we appreciate your patience. Uh, one of the reasons we're filming this on Saturday, so that you can watch it either tonight or Sunday morning for Easter, is because the internet is just overwhelmed. Uh, we know of churches that have had over 100,000 people live streaming. And I read uh, today in the paper, and I heard President Trump say that he's going to tune into First Baptist. Uh, live streaming service in the morning. So you can do that as well. But what we learned last week, uh, three things. We always have three takeaways from the previous lesson. And the prophet Daniel accurately prophesied that the Jews would be released from Babylon captivity after 70 years. And that the Messiah would come 490 years after that to uh, command to rebuild Jerusalem and then be made a sacrifice for sin. And that's Daniel chapter 9, 24 to 26. Then number two, the last seven bold judgments of God's wrath are his final justice for those who took the mark of the beast and worshiped his image. And they're going to endure physical suffering from these judgments. They're also going to receive death and then eternal hell. So those that take the mark of the beast really have a desperate future. And then number three, the seven bowls of wrath, which is uh, chapter 16, which we'll be studying some today are very similar to the way God judged Pharaoh, the stiff-necked leader of the Egyptian people, for their brutal enslavement of the Hebrew people and their worship of idols and no repentance. And that's found in Exodus chapters 7 through 12. And if you look uh, in your Bible to... The book of Matthew. That's where we're going to take the Easter lesson today. But if you look on page two of your outline, we have pray for the nation. And we need your prayers for the nation. We need to pray for President Trump. Uh, I've written the paper several letters about uh, what a great job I think he is doing through this pandemic. And of course, they haven't printed any of those yet. Uh, what a surprise in the Dallas Morning News. But this week, we're praying for the Secretary of the Treasury, Steve Mnuchin, who needs good, godly wisdom on how to get this economy back up and running. And then the state of Michigan, uh, the governor, Gretchen Whitmer, she's also referred to as Gretchen Weiner, uh, she seems to complain a lot. And then down in the house, there is uh, one name that stands out to me, uh, very anti-Semitic, and that's Rashida Tlaib. But we do need to pray for Michigan. They're having a terrible time with this coronavirus, a lot of death. And then the scripture we'll get to 
a little bit later during the lesson. But you know, the Bible always refers to it's always darkest right before the dawn. And the scriptures say weeping lasts for but a night, but joy comes in the morning. And Easter is that joy, that blessed hope. The greatest day in the history of the human race is Easter Sunday, because it gives us the hope of the resurrection to all those who believe. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. He was a sacrifice for our sin. And we'll get into that crucifixion scene, which always breaks my heart. Uh, when I see the movie, The Passion of the Christ, it disturbs me greatly uh, because I love the Lord so much. Now, in your outline, the first event that we covered last Sunday was Jesus's triumphant entry to Jerusalem. Now, this fulfilled several prophecies. Of course, it fulfilled Daniel's prophecy uh, when he said that the Messiah would come through almost to the day of when he was told by the angel Gabriel. And then Zechariah said that, uh, Daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt the foal of a donkey. And then five days later, Jesus was crucified. So it's an amazing story that starts out with this plot against Jesus. And if you turn to Matthew 26, verses 1 through 4, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, now he infuriated the religious leaders. He cleansed the temple of their money-changing profit center. And then he brought a stinging sermon to the Pharisees and the scribes, and they began to build up a tremendous hate for Jesus, but primarily because he was hurting their financial situation. And so in Matthew 26, one through four, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said, to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away. Now this Passover this year coincides on Thursday. And the Son of Man will be handed to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. And they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and to kill him and involve Judas Iscariot in this plot. And then on Thursday, the last supper, the last Passover Seder, in Matthew 26, 18 to 30, Jesus replied, go to the city to a certain man and tell him. The teacher says, my appointed time is near. Jesus knew what was about to happen to him. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12. And while they were eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. Now he knew exactly who was going to betray him. And they were very sad and began to say to one another, surely you don't mean me, Lord. And Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl that will betray me, the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. Hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament about how Jesus would be born, how he would live, and how he would die, and how he would be resurrected. The Son of Man will go just as it is written, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, 
you have said it. You said so. And while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he gives thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, the first communion, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, he didn't say everyone. He said many. You had to decide to receive this blessing. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom when the kingdom comes to earth for the thousand-year reign. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now this next passage really touches my soul, Matthew 26, verse 39. And Jesus says this, going a little further, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. But yet, not as I will, but as you will. He was following his father's instructions all the way. And then drop down to verse 26, 53 to 54. And Jesus says, do you think I cannot call on my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. Now, a Roman legion back in those days was anywhere from 3,000 to 6,000 men. So you're talking about Jesus could call 72,000 angels to defend him. And if we remember in the Old Testament, one angel killed 180,000 Philistines. That is the power of the angels. But how then would the scripture be fulfilled that it must happen this way? The scriptures must be fulfilled. They are the word of God. And Jesus willingly gave his life as a ransom for many. I don't know how many of us, if we had the power to stop what was going to happen and defend ourselves, would we have been able to follow the path that Jesus followed. And then in Matthew 26, 63 to 65, but Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the son of God. And Jesus answered Caiaphas the same way he answered Judas. You have said so. You've said it. Jesus replied, but I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the mighty God, then coming on the clouds of the heavens. Then the high priest tore his clothes, a sign of distress, and he has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. So, Caiaphas is condemning him and getting the Romans to crucify him. And then in Matthew 27, 22 to 25, what shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? Pontius Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Now, five days earlier, they were saying Hosanna in the highest Baruch Hashem, Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then five days later, they're shouting, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent. Of this man's blood, he said, he is your responsibility. And all the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. 
And unfortunately, that proclamation has held true for over 2,000 years. In AD 70, the Romans ransacked Jerusalem, killing thousands and thousands of Jews. And then, of course, the Holocaust. In both Germany and Russia, millions and millions were killed. Their blood was upon them. And the saying, I wash my hands of this, of course, that's also of the coronavirus, but I wash my hands of this uh, is a saying that's true to this day. People use that same saying. And then Matthew 27, 35 to 37, and when they had crucified him, now he was on the cross for about six hours. They divided up his clothes by casting lots. That's a fulfillment of Psalm 22, verse 18. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Now, I've often wondered why these Roman soldiers, who were probably pretty well paid, wanted to divide up Jesus' clothes. Well, I read, interesting, that Jesus' robe, and by the way, that's one of my favorite movies, The Robe, uh, was extremely high quality. They said it was not a patchwork uh, quilt item. It was extremely high quality. So probably someone like Joseph of Arimathea uh, made a gift of this robe to Jesus, but it was something that these soldiers wanted. And that fulfilled scripture as well. And then on page five, Matthew 27, verses 45 to 46. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness fell over the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lima, Sabachthani which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now he's quoting Psalm 22, verse 1. And it's not that his father had forsaken him, but he became sin. He became the curse. And all the awful sins that people have done through time immemorial, Think of the absolute worst things you've done in your life. Think of the worst things that other people have done. All of that fell on Jesus at that time. Paul says in Galatians 3.13, He redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Jesus paid it all, and all to him. I uh, Matthew 27, 51, great verse. It says, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks split. Now, what this signified is that we no longer need a Caiaphas. We don't need a high priest. We, Jesus is our high priest. We can go directly to him anytime, any place. He intercedes for us. He is the great high priest. Now this, this curtain was not like a curtain in your home. It was about six inches thick. It was extremely thick and strong, and it ripped from the top, from God's perspective, down. It didn't rip from the bottom up. It ripped from the top down. And then Matthew 27, 59 to 60. Joseph of Arimathea took the body and wrapped it in a clean white cloth, linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. Joseph was very wealthy. And he had prepared this tomb for himself. But he wanted Jesus to have the best burial. And 
it fulfilled another prophecy in Isaiah uh, chapter 53, verse 9, where the prophet said that the Messiah would be buried with the rich, even though he was among sinners. And then Joseph had a big stone rolled in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. And then Sunday, Friday, Saturday, but Sunday's coming, Easter, the resurrection. And that's in Matthew 28, 1 to 7. After the Sabbath, at dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. The women were the bold ones that wanted to go see and see if they could do any care for Jesus. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. And going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid that they shook and became like dead men, I can imagine. Now, the guard that was put on Jesus' tomb was a standard guard of ten Roman soldiers. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he has said. Come and see the place where he lay, then go quickly tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. And then finally, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. The risen Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. And we see that through the whole book of Revelation that we're studying. <clears throat> Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, the great comforting words of our Lord, and surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. So that's our Easter lesson. If you turn your page over, this is chapter 16 of Revelation. You can turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 16. And this is the seven bold judgments or vile judgments. It's called in the King James. But these are the seven final judgments that God's pouring out. And one of the things you have to remember when studying Revelation is John's vision takes him back and forth quite a bit in a timeline, <coughs> excuse me, in verse 1 in chapter 16, it starts out with the bowls of wrath. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a terrible, grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them that worshipped his image. That's men and women who ever worshipped him. Now, that's interesting. That was the sixth plague in the tenth plagues of Egypt, the sores. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of dead men. And every living soul died in the sea. There goes that whole food source. And that was the first judgment against Egypt, uh, against Pharaoh. And the third angel poured out his vial on the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became as blood. And again, we talked about the red tide, what it can do to water, fresh and salt. And it's a plankton that is poisonous. And so people are losing not only their food sources, their drinking water sources. And that, again, was the first plague in Egypt. 
And then I heard the angel of the water say, You are righteous, O Lord, which are and were and shall be one who lives forever and ever because you have judged this way. For they have shed the blood of saints and of prophets, <clears throat> and you have given them blood to drink. For they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. And then in verse 8, the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. The sun is heating up sunspots. It's making things incredibly hot here on earth. And men were scorched with great heat, but they blasphemed the name of God, which has the power of the plagues, and they repented not, nor give him glory, which was what he was trying to achieve with these, is to turn people to repentance. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they repented not of their deeds. In verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, testing the water thereof and dried it up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared for war. This is the battle of Armageddon. It is coming and it's going to wipe out all of the evildoers. 13, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. That plague was like the uh, frogs in uh, the, the plagues in Egypt. That was uh, one of the same things that happened there. And the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty, the day of the Lord, the final battle. Behold, this is Jesus speaking in verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. He said he would come as a thief in the night because it's totally unexpected. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments. He keeps his salvation intact and he keeps the word of God wrapped around him and the Holy Spirit, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. His wrath has run its course. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, that's Jerusalem, and the cities of the nations fell, and the great Babylon came in remembrance to God. Now, Babylon is a symbol of rebellion, of evil, of everything wrong with this one world government, with this antichrist leader, with the false prophet, everything about it molds into the image of Babylon. Came in remembrance before God to give to her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, 
Every stone about the weight of a talent, that's approximately 120 pounds, hailstones. Now we get some hailstorms here in Texas, but nothing like that. This would be unbelievable. And men blaspheme God. They knew these were coming, these plagues, because of their sin and their allegiance to the beast and taking his mark. But yet they still blaspheme God because of the plague of the hell. For the plague thereof was exceedingly great. So those are the seven vile judgments. Next week we'll get into chapter 17. But I want to review a couple of things and what we learned this week. Number one, numerous prophecies concerning Jesus' betrayal, his trials, his crucifixion, and his resurrection all came true accurately. Fulfilled prophecies prove that the word of God is true and that Christ is the son of the living God and we worship his resurrection for Easter Sunday. Number two, he became sin on the cross to take away the curse of the law and to receive our punishment in full to tell style. It is finished. It is his gift, gift to us, to all who will receive it. And that uh, brings me to Isaiah 53, verse 5. Isaiah 53 is one of the great prophecy chapters about Christ. And uh, I encourage anyone who has a non-believing family member, especially a Jewish uh, friend, Quote this verse to him, Isaiah 53, 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. You know, God is so faithful to tell us what's coming and how to live, but more importantly, how to die, and we're ready to meet our maker. He'll either rapture us or we'll go meet him because the apostle Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And then number three, the seven bold judgments in chapter 16 signal the end of God's wrath and setting up the end of the tribulation culminating with the Battle of Armageddon. So things are really heating up. We'll spend probably another couple of months finishing Revelation. I just hope we can do some more of this in person. I know each of us uh, long to see each other, to hug each other. Uh, Dr. Fauci said he'll, he'd like to see an end of shaking hands. I think that would be very, very sad. Uh, Carol Haley sends me some interesting things and some funny things. And she sent me this cartoon and there's always a lot of truth in some of these cartoons, but it's a cartoon from Peanuts. And Lucy is sitting against a tree talking to Charlie Brown and he's on the other side. And she said, Charlie Brown, what do you think of this coronavirus? And Charlie Brown answered, you know, it's done something that no woman could do. It canceled all sports. It closed all the bars permanently. And it kept all the men at home every night. So it was interesting. And that's what's happened. We're sequestered. But through technology, we can be with each other, pray for each other, call each other. Send each other notes of encouragement. People need to be encouraged. There's so much fear in the marketplace. And let's just close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you 
this Easter Sunday. And we thank you for your precious gift of your only son who was born of a virgin, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. But the third day, he rose again from the dead. And that gives us the hope, not only here today, but for eternity. Lord Jesus, we love you. We praise your holy name. We thank you for sending us your Holy Spirit to guide us and help us to learn and to study and to be great witnesses. And we give you thanks for all of this in your holy, precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We'll see you next week.